we are going to get into a little bit more applied stuff with thermo relative to what we have done. It's still going to be lots and lots of partial derivatives. It's partial derivatives all through. But so what have we done so far in thermo? The main post postulate, or you can even call it a law of nature, was that for isolated systems, which are characterized by constant number, volume, and energy, right? There exists equilibrium states, right? And these equilibrium states are characterized by S of NVE being maximized, right? That was the characterization of equilibrium states in an isolated system. When you start statistical mechanics next semester, you will again start from this point, but then you will think about the microscopic configurations that go inside such an equilibrium state in an isolated system. And there you will study that if it's an isolated system, all microstates are equally likely. That's the statistical mechanics equivalent of this thing, but we are not doing that, that is next semester. So this was for a, this was for a system with, which was completely isolated. You know, the number, volume, and energy are constant. That's not very useful. We have to make it practical, right? So in order to make it practical, we thought about systems where number, volume, and temperature are constant, for example, right? There, what was the state function corresponding to these natural variables? Helmholtz energy, right? A of NVT. And did it have to be maximized or minimized? Minimized, right? There's a huge difference. So this had to be minimized. And we saw that through a couple of lines of algebra as to why that is the case. Then which else, which other thing did we go to? NPT, right? What was the state function here? Gibbs. Gibbs. So at NPT conditions, Gibbs free energy has to be minimized. And in the later, in the remaining part of the semester, we are really going to focus on this one. We already got a taste for it when we looked at partial molar quantity, right? Because a lot of chemistry, a lot of experiments happen in constant pressure and temperature condition, right? It's just a beaker. You know, you're heating it at a particular temperature or you're keeping a temperature constant through some uh, mechanism. So we are going to focus on this for a little bit. Then in a couple of weeks or so, I will come back to something known as Lagrangian transforms and show you why these are actually connected in a more deeper sense from a mathematical perspective. For that, I have posted an article online on the class webpage. It's called Making Sense of Lagrangian Transforms. I really recommend reading it. It's by someone known as Roy Zia, who is a, was a professor at Virginia Tech, and Joe Reddish, who used to be a physics professor here who was very interested in making things. You know, it's from, it's from like uh, Physics Today or one magazine. So please read it before I come to Lagrangian Transforms in a couple of weeks, it will help you. It's a longer article. It will show you why these things are connected. So in next two weeks, within next two weeks rather, read Zia's Reddish article on web page. Okay, so go through that. And we are doing okay on pace. I will probably need to do one extra class at some point. It will be on Zoom, okay? And I will put lots and lots of options so that it will be in the evening on Zoom, like one and a half hour. And I will put lots of options so I can make sure that everyone is there present. But if not, the video will be recorded. So I will need one extra class, otherwise we're doing fine. So these are the key things that you should really remember from the first part of the semester. If you look at the syllabus, the first part of the semester is actually four out of five parts of the syllabus. That's what we really did. Now we are focusing on the fifth part, but this will take us half the semester. So the other thing I want you to remember from before the semester, which is it's so noisy. Hey, uh, what I saying? The other thing I want you to remember is we introduced this notion of partial molar quantity. Remember? We said that A can be written as A1 bar N1 plus A2 bar N2 plus A3 bar N2. And any extensive quantity can be written in this manner. V1 bar N2 plus V2 bar N2 plus V3 bar N3 dot dot dot, right? We could do it for any extensive quantity, including Gibbs free energy. G is equal to G1 bar N1 plus G2 bar N2. But the way we define partial molar, we defined it at constant pressure and temperature. So Gibbs free energy had a special significance. Gibbs free energy was the only one for which we could also write it as G is equal to mu1 N1 
plus mu2 n2 plus mu3 n3, right? This did not exist for other quantities. A is not equal to mu1 n1 plus mu2 n2 plus mu3 n3, right? So as we start, I want you to go back and really go through this derivation and this statement should be obvious to you. If it's not obvious, then you're gonna be in trouble in the remaining second half. The next homeworks, the next midterm, the final will be absolutely type three fun. You'll be utterly confused. You'll scream and cry and hate me. That was vivid enough, right? So please go and look at this derivation and make sure that you understand it. Why does, where does this come from? This came from how we define chemical potentials, right? This came from looking at all fundamental equations. DG was VDP minus SDT plus mu DN, right? So we could define mu as partial G by partial N at constant P and T. For other things, mu is not partial A by partial N at constant P and T, right? It's other things. So it, it's this special connection between pressure, temperature, and G that allows us to write this equation. So we are going to use this one. So those are the two things I wanted you to recap, and I really emphasize that this should be clear to you from right before the exam when we did this. Why did I say that A is not equal to this one? Back then you all nodded your head, but as one or two weeks from now, you'll be like, uh, no, I don't know why. So, you know, so try to go and remember. So why do we want to do all this? So, so far we have established that equilibrium state under constant pressure and temperature, for example, is one which minimizes Gibbs free energy, right? But now we want to make it more practical for variety of chemicals, right? When you have a chemical, it's going to be a mixture of different components, right? You will, you will not just have one species, you will have different species that exist in it. On top of it, this chemical can take different phases, right? Think about the simplest chemical or most important, not simplest actually, it's quite complicated, water, which is the most important chemical in life, right? Water can exist as solid, ice, and gas. Even in solid, it can take this many different phases, right? So now we are going to develop the machinery to understand what are the phases in a single component system, in a multi-component system, what drives these phases to exist? That's what we are going to study. I posted uh, the, uh, actually, let's go to Slack and, uh, where is it? and look at the service thing I posted so I can tell you. So we are going to talk about phases, phase diagrams, and phase transitions. There is this concept of fugacity, which just shows up like in the, in the uh, with no connection to anything else. Fugacity is one of those. Is there anyone in this class who would like to claim that they understand? A little bit, then we'll move to other things. So, but most what mostly what we are going to do is to talk about phases, phase diagrams, and phase transitions. And then I wrote down a bunch of topics that, and I'm I'm going to make sure we cover everything. None of this will be left. We will talk about phase rule, phase boundaries, Clapeyron equation. We will try to understand why. Is there anyone here who likes ice skating? Okay, Ben, how do you think ice skating works? Isn't there like a layer? Water. No, it's not true. You'll see why that might not be the case. It's it's true and not true. So it's not just melting. It's a bit more than that. It's it's so uh, it's way more complicated. It, there is a layer, but the layer is actually nanometer thing, thing, which you cannot really explain on the basis of clear thermodynamics. So we will explain why ice skating is not quite the same as what you think it is. Then we will talk about the larger transforms. We will talk about critical points. We will get into mixtures. Lots and lots of good stuff. At the very end, we will talk about how do we get dynamics out of thermodynamics, right? It's not easy, you cannot do it, basically. But there are approximations. One such approximation is transition state theory. I'll tell you a little bit about that, and I will tell you a little bit about classical nucleation theory. These are the final two topics we are going to do. So uh, let's get back to this. So I want to talk about fugacity. And you will see why it matters a lot. So, and again, and in the remaining part of the semester, we are really going to be focusing on Gibbs free energy because we are interested in constant pressure temperature conditions. Right? That's 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 the reason. So we are interested in dG 
is equal to VDP minus SDT plus mu DN, right? If it's a experiment where we can control pressure and temperature, then this is the state function we should think of, right? Dg. On top of that, let's assume constant composition. If it's a constant composition system, then dn does not matter, right? dn goes to zero. Then this becomes dg is equal to vdp minus sdt. So what does this tell us about partial g by partial p at constant t and n? We could have written down without equation two, but that's fine. What will this be? You have it in equation two. V, right? I would have expected more sound because it worries me. So this is V, right? So the change in Gibbs free energy with pressure at constant temperature and number is volume, okay? So now let's imagine, const we said constant composition, let's imagine constant temperature also. At constant temperature and constant composition, How would, let's say you are changing the pressure. We change pressure from some initial value PI to some final value PF. If we do this at constant T and constant N, what is going to be the change in G? We can just integrate this thing, right? It will be look like a sim simple derivative because it's no longer partial, those things are constant, right? So it will look like G of PF, G at the final pressure PF is equal to G at an initial pressure PI plus integral of VDP as you go from PI to PF, right? This, this is an exact equation. This holds true for any, any material, ideal, non-ideal at constant uh, temperature and pressure. So as you saw in problem seven in the exam, you had an isotherm and an adiabat, right? For an ideal gas, by assuming ideal gas law, it was very easy to show that why the adiabat is steeper than an isotherm. But those of you who bought through the second part, which was significantly harder, it is actually true for any material. An adiabat is always going to be steeper than an isotherm. So this is kind of amazing that thermodynamics allows us to derive things like this for absolutely anything, right? And when I say non-ideal, that could be a fancy, quantum material with complicated long range interactions, the adiabat still has to be steeper than the isotherm. It could be some experiment that you have done in the core of the sun. The adiabat should still be steeper than the isotherm, just doesn't matter, right? As long as it's equilibrium. If you're out of equilibrium, then this story goes away, right? This oh. is all under equilibrium, go ahead. So in the derivation for the general thing, the, the internal pressure matters. Hey, let me grade it, man, <laughs> don't worry. There are many ways no, of deriving it. So that's not the case then, or no, it is? Let me grade and then ask me this question after grading. It, it, of course, it will matter. Anytime it's not, whether you have to use the internal pressure in an ideal gas, I don't know. You are the one who derived it. I haven't derived it yet. Let me go and see. No, for the general case. You so I, what's your question? Well, so you claim that that is always the case for any material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but what I'm saying is, what if we have a material that does not have that behavior that the internal pressure, for example, is always positive. If the adiabat still has to be steeper than isotherm if the process is being carried out at equilibrium, period. You just proved it. Are you doubting your answer? But the proof depends on the positivity. Oh, then I have to, see, then I'm going to pay a special attention to Shah's solution. <laughs> you might have made some assumptions, which are not that general. Yeah, if the should be positive, but that's Okay, but let's get back to the answer later, okay? It's, you should be able to prove it in the most general cases. If you are making assumptions, if you end up making assumptions, yeah, let me get back to it, but heat capacity being positive or temperature being positive, these are all, again, implied from equilibrium. So many of the assumptions you made probably are equivalent to saying equilibrium. Okay, so don't, don't freak out. Let me, <laughs> let's come back to this. But now for this one, let's assume ideal gas, because this is true in general. We cannot do too much, too much here, right? We don't know how V depends on P. If you are willing to assume an equation of state, 
ideal gas is a simple equation of state, right? You could have Van der Waals gas. You could still put in the V as a function of P over there. And temperature is constant, so it does not really matter. If you put in here the Van der Waals equation of state, you could still do this integral. It will be a complicated integral, right? So here we are going to put an equation of state. The simplest equation of state we can put is the ideal gas, where we can actually do the algebra in class. So we will assume ideal gas. If we assume ideal gas, then we know PV is equal to nRT or V is equal to nRT multiplied by one over pressure, right? And nRT is going to be constant because this process is happening under constant temperature. Therefore, G of PF is equal to G of PI plus nRT, and again, the temperature can go outside because the process is happening at constant temperature, PI to PF dP by P. And this is an easy integral. This is just the log of pressure. So what did we get? We got, and furthermore, now let's assume one mole of ideal gas. Okay, we simplified it even more. For one mole of ideal gas, N can be set to equal to one. So this will give us G of PF is equal to G of PI plus RT LN PF by PI, okay? Those who did not copy, don't worry. I'm going to repeat this equation on the next page exactly as it is. So we just got equation four that G of PF is equal to G of PI plus RT LN PF by PI. So, <clears throat> This is telling us if you had some initial pressure PI and at that pressure, so let's say PI is equal to some, some reference pressure, okay? One atmosphere, anything that you want. Let's call it P naught because I sounds like some initial state. Let's say we fix it, okay? We call it P naught, some initial pressure. Let's say at this initial pressure, the value of Gibbs free energy Pi is equal to P naught. My super subscript became subscript. Yes, okay. Is equal to G naught. Let's say it's just some number, okay? And it won't matter that much. It's, it's just some number which you measured, which whatever it is. Then we can write down the change of Gibbs free energy as a function of pressure as G of P is equal to G naught plus RT ln P by P naught. This is the equation, the most important equation from today. And this will, this type of relation will show up again and again in the remaining part of the semester. So we will call this equation five. I want us to plot it. So on the X axis, I'm going to have pressure. On the y-axis, I'm going to have G. And let's say this is my P naught. Again, I want to emphasize there is nothing special about P naught. It is just some pressure, okay? At this pressure, let's say you were able to calculate the value or you knew the value of Gibbs free energy as uh, G naught. And again, G naught could be positive. Here I'm showing it as positive. It could be negative, it doesn't matter. Some number, okay, on the y-axis. Now my question for you is, given equation five, what happens to the Gibbs energy as P goes to infinity, as the pressure is ramped up more and more and more? What is log of, yeah, go ahead. It, it diverges, right? And it diverges logarithmically, right? It's just log of X. And if you remember, exponential of X diverges very quickly, right? Log of X diverges slowly, right? What is log of 100? Two. What is log of 1,000? Three. What is log of a million? Six. It increases very, very slowly as opposed to exponential. Exponential of 100 and exponential of 1,000 increases enormous, right? So it, it changes as a logarithmic function, something like this. What happens to G? We know at P0, it is G0. We just set that reference value. What happens to G as P tends to zero?
it will be some number, right? We don't care about it. It's some number. It's, but a, a better question is what happens to G as P tends to... No, actually, yeah. Let's get back to... No, that is the most important question. I was going to make P negative. That's not going to happen. Yeah. So what happens to P, uh, G as P tends to zero? Minus infinity. Why? Because log of zero is a very, very, very small number. So it will go to... So it's going to look something like this. Okay. Very negative number. Very big negative number. Right? Everyone happy with this? We derived this curve for an ideal gas, right? Turns out the limiting behavior of this curve is true for everything. The fact that you will see this type of behavior that as pressure goes to zero, the free energy diverges. This will keep showing up for any material. We will see later as to why this is a generic behavior. But this overall smooth logarithmic curve is true only for an ideal gas. That's why we were able to derive, right? So this is true for an ideal gas. And if this would be true for everything, life would be wonderful, right? You could just measure the G. I mean, all you need to do if you have some complicated chemical reaction happening, you just need one reference pressure and you're set, right? You know G at any temperature of interest. You know G at any pressure of interest, right? This is fantastic. This will make life so simple. Unfortunately, it's not true, right? It's not true for anything except ideal gas and nothing is ideal. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. You said um, if you have a reference pressure, you know G at any temperature? If you knew G naught at some reference pressure P naught, then this equation is set, right? Then you can calculate G at any temperature and any pressure, right? Because you can change temperature also. We derived it, this thing, and this is, goes back to the thing we did earlier. You know, this equation, this process is written for a constant temperature process, but the equation itself is true, right? It has temperature. You can go and put the value of temperature and be done. So it's, it's super powerful. But unfortunately, it's rarely true. Any more questions? Yeah. So the same kind of trend is true for all materials? Oh, we'll come back to that. Okay. That's moment. Now I have you hooked. So let me write this down. So this equation, G of P is equal to G naught plus RP ln P by P naught and sometimes my G naught becomes G superscript. Sometimes it becomes G subscript. It's okay. Uh, is true for an ideal gas, one mole of an ideal gas. So let's, let's see what this really means. What this equation really means is, before, before we go to non-ideal, I want to do something more with this equation, okay? What I want to do is remember we are talking about one mole of an ideal gas, okay? So if we assume a one component system, just one mole of a one component ideal gas, We had previously, I wrote down at the beginning of this class, G is equal to mu one N one plus mu two N two plus dot, 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 right? If it's a one component system, and this is true for non-ideal also, right? This equation was true for everything. So you have to be careful every time you write an equation, which one is true for which you have to keep careful count. This was true for non-ideal, but if it was a one component system, what would this become? G is equal to mu one and one, right? There is no other component. And if there is only one component system, why do we want to carry one and two and three, right? It's just mu. So G is equal to mu n for a one component system. Again, one of these equations that may be obvious to you right now, I bet in a month from now, or well, in a month from now, your everything will seem obvious to you, right? Because you will be like masters of thermodynamics. But starting December 20th, it will go down, right? It will decay. Then right before your calls, there will be a local maxima. And then it will again decay. And then you will become a professor like me and one day start teaching and then it will again start to go up and then never decay. 
that's what it is. I totally forgot these things after my calls. Could we have written down something like this for the Helmholtz free energy? Why not? Lydia? <laughs> See, she's speaking <laughs> almost my language now because A is partial of whatever and whatever and G is whatever and whatever. Don't do that in the exam, okay? <laughs> but I, I see you have the right idea because A had the, only G has a special relation with T and T, right? And, we are, and mu is partial molars are defined in mu and T, right? So this, this is not true. A is not equal to mu n, but G is equal to mu n. That's what we are going to use here. So let's call this equation number six. So this tells us mu is equal to g by n, right? And I point out this relation because you will see it happening in literature when you read a paper on any chemical that you're working with, you will see mu is equal to g by n. If it's a one component system, if it's not a one component system, mu is not equal to g by n, right? If it's a multi-component system, then mu i is equal to partial g by partial n i at constant temperature pressure and all other j not equal to i being held constant, right? That's the definition of chemical potential. This is always true for one component system. It doesn't have to be ideal. It is true in general, okay? Let's call this equation seven. And this one is true for, always true for, well, everything. That's very, very general. So, <clears throat> so this equation that we wrote down, G is equal to G naught plus RT ln P by P naught, we said it's a one, one mole system. If it was a multi, this is, per mole, right? If you had a multimolar system, if you had more than one mole of the system, what would it look like? It would become G is equal to G naught plus NRT ln P by P naught, right? Let's call this equation number eight. So I want you to put equation seven in equation eight and then see what happens. I should be using small and everywhere, just well. Now my small and sometimes put some big and sorry about that. I'll, I'll use capital N, that's more consistent. So if I divide both sides by capital N, what do I get? G by N is equal to G naught by N naught plus RT ln P by P naught, right? Now look at equation eight. Equation eight says that G by N for a one component system, as many moles, is mu, right? Everyone happy with that? For a one component system, G by N is equal to mu. Also, I wrote G naught by N naught. That does not make sense. It's just G naught by N. So this becomes mu and G naught by N, we can write as some mu naught, right? It's the same thing at some reference pressure. Is equal to mu naught plus RT ln P by P naught. This equation is equivalent to equation five for an ideal gas one component system. Okay, I'll write it down on the next page again. So mu is equal to mu naught plus RT ln P by P naught, equation number nine. Is true for one component ideal gas, right? Everyone happy with this? As happy as you can be in thermodynamics. What will be the equivalent of this? If so, mu on its own takes care for the number of moles, right? Because it is G divided by number of moles. Completely equivalent to this equation, is writing G is equal to G naught plus NRT 
ln p by p naught for n moles of one component ideal gas. Normally what people do, most of the times you will see P naught does not even show up. People just set it as one atmosphere, right? If you set it as one atmosphere and you work in the units of atmosphere, then it's nice. So normally, I mean, that's why it's called normal temperature and pressure, right? So normally P naught is equal to one atmosphere. Then mu is equal to mu naught plus RT ln P, okay? So before we get into what will this curve that we drew look like for an ideal chemical or an ideal material, let's try to look a bit more at equation number nine and equation number 10, which are equivalent, just its number of components that have changed. So let's look at, which one should we look at? Let's look at equation 10 and keep and move. So let's say you set reference pressure P naught and Gibbs G naught and measured or happen to know somehow Gibbs G naught at that reference pressure. Then if you do an experiment and you measure the value of G minus G naught, okay? If you measure the value of G minus G naught and you divide it by R N R T, okay? And you take an exponential of this quantity, what would it look like after equation 10? The answer is there. P over P naught. I want everyone to stare at equation 10 and see that's all I have done here, right? So I took G naught and I brought it to the left side. Then I divided it by NRT. And then I saw this log was dangling over here. So I took the exponential of both side, right? So on the left side, you get exponential of G minus G naught by NRT. On the right side, you get just P by P naught, right? So this tells us that if you had set a value of P naught, let's do one more thing. Let's bring this P naught to the left-hand side. Let's write this as P naught multiplied by e to the power, this thing. So that's a powerful statement, right? That's not obvious at all, right? You knew some reference pressure P naught, and you fix some reference free energy G naught, and you measure the G as a function of temperature, and you do this complicated mathematical business of taking G minus G naught by NRT, and then take its exponential and multiply it by P naught, complicated. What are you left with? The pressure. That's kind of crazy, right? Isn't it? I think it's crazy because the reason it's crazy is because I'm telling you the opposite thing. I'm telling you is measure the G and then you will to recover the P. G is harder to measure, but P is easy to measure, right? So this just tells you that, right, that if you knew the P, you can get back the G. But this is true only for an ideal gas. So around 200 years ago, when people first derived things like this, they saw, oh, this is so beautiful. I wish this would be true for everything. That's not gonna happen, right? But they were so obsessed with this form that they said, okay, fine. You know what? This is true for an ideal gas. Now let's think about some other real chemical. And it doesn't have to be one component. It could be a mixture, whatever they said. For this real chemical, once again, let's fix the value of the pressure P0. Let's calculate the value G0. And let's do the same experiment, okay? Let's do the same calculation. For this real thing, I'm going to again measure P naught multiplied by e to the power G minus G naught by NRT. What will this be equal to? Will it be equal to pressure? 
Anjali, what do you think? If this thing was equal to pressure, what can we say about that system? It's ideal, but it's not ideal. So in reality, it won't be equal to pressure. So what would it be equal to? There comes our fugacity. F. So people said, I don't know who these people were, but you know, there were some scientists of great repute, probably men because 200 years ago, women were not doing science, it's terrible. So they said that if you measure G as a function of temperature and you know some reference P naught and G naught for an ideal thing, it would be this quantity on the left would be equal to pressure. For a non-ideal thing, it won't be equal to pressure, but it will be something, right? Let's call that thing fugacity. So even, and now let's go back to what I said earlier. I said all of this is being done at constant number and constant temperature, right? So let's say temperature is held constant, even though the equations give you the power to then talk about other temperature. For now, let's assume temperature is constant. So this fugacity will be now a function of pressure, right? In the most general case, it will be something that depends on pressure, okay? So let, let me write this down again. For an ideal gas, and now I will write it down in the logarithmic form. So here I had P naught multiplied by E to the power, all this blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I will write it down in the logarithmic form. For an ideal gas, G is equal to G naught plus N R T L N P by P naught. For the for general case, and the general case could very general is general, right? So ideal is a subset of general, right? It includes ideal. It's not like it won't work if it's it's a bad theory if it stops working for ideal, right? So for so I won't say all general case. For general case, G is equal to G naught plus N R T L N F by P naught. And this F is called fugacity is a function of pressure for ideal gas fugacity f is equal to pressure right there is no difference for a non ideal gas f will not be equal to pressure it will be something multiplied by pressure that thing let's call it phi this is now known as the fugacity coefficient. The thing that I'm going to show you next is that, well, this is obvious that phi is equal to one. Is it ideal or non-ideal? If the fugacity coefficient for one at every pressure, then it's ideal behavior. Is this phi option of Oh yeah, phi itself can be a function of pressure. If phi is more than one, phi can be more than one, phi can be less than one, phi can depend on pressure, it can be all sorts of things, okay? And most generally it will depend on pressure. I will show you next that phi more than one tells us that the material or the chemical is dominated by repulsive forces and phi less than one means why the chemical it tells us that the thing is dominated by attractive forces. Now this makes it super, super useful, right? Why does it make it so useful? Because Gibbs free energy is a state function, right? Right now you are sitting in a thermodynamics theory class thinking, I don't know how to calculate any of this. You keep saying I can measure the heat in a calorimeter. But you know, you, you have to take my word that as I showed you, like gibbs helmholtz equation and things like that, right? If you measure the H in a calorimeter, you have ways to convert it to G, right? So maybe, so let's say Matt here, uh, who, who are you doing your rotations with? Let me try to remember. With uh, Alice? That's the next one, yeah. And the previous one was with Porcus? No. That was the first one. For the first one, let's say. So let's say you want work with one of these two, right? Whoever it is. And they give you this complicated chemical that you don't know what, what is the nature of bonding inside it? Maybe it's Van der Waals forces, maybe it's hydrophobic interaction, something is going on, right? But they tell you, your advisor tells you that they have done some experiment where they have been able to measure the G value 
at different temperatures and different pressures, right? So now what you can do is to go and plot this. You take those values of you take those values of G, you subtract G naught from it, you divide by nRT, you exponentiate it, and you plot it, right? This will give you fugacity. Then you go and see at a particular pressure, this fugacity, was it more than pressure? Was it smaller than pressure? If it's smaller than pressure, as I will show you next, it means that this complicated chemical that you had is dominated by attractive forces. That's the nature of interaction. But if it was more than one, it tells you that it's dominated by repulsive forces. Furthermore, if you are able to see how phi changes as a function of pressure, you suddenly have an understanding how the how is the nature of bonding changing inside this material? Maybe repulsive forces are changing to attractive forces, right? And chemistry is, you would think, why do we care about repulsive and attractive forces? I mean, chemistry is really a balance between repulsive and attractive forces, right? Uh, why does, why do two things, why does sodium and, chlor sodium and chloride come together to form a bond? Why does Na plus Cl minus form a bond? Any ideas? You're nodding your head, you don't know. Plus and minus. So what is the attractive force in sodium and chloride? Coulombic. Coulombic. But there is a repulsive force also. Yes. What is that? The core and the... the core, right? So they will come close, but at some point they will be like too close, go away, right? So it's always a trade-off between these things. At a more larger scale, can you think of attractive versus repulsive forces in biology? We have many biophysics students here who can help me. What's an example of a repulsive force in biophysics? I'm looking at Maria Della. I don't know. Tell me. Hydrophobic forces, right? For example, water. If something does not like water, it's like, I don't like water. Right? If you don't like water and he does not like water, then both of you will be like, let's shun water. Right? So this becomes an important tool. But now we have to understand why this is the case. Okay? <clears throat> so, yeah. So you do this mathematical thing, and then you measure phi as a function of pressure. Yeah. Eventually, phi should change so that it would reach as one, because that would be more favored than energetic. Or no? no, it's not a question of, it's all relative. So let, let me draw the graph. You'll see, phi is equal to one tells you that you're approaching ideal behavior. OK, let, let, let me get to this. this. This is a very good point. So let me start by asking you, clearly, me asking you questions does not seem to stop you from asking me questions. I'll keep asking you questions. Okay, good. So let's draw G versus P. We saw how it looks for an ideal gas, right? For an ideal gas, it starts at minus infinity and it increases logarithmically, right? And I'm not going to bother with drawing the reference value and reference free energy. It is what it is, right? It's some value. It doesn't matter. So this is phi is equal to one and G is equal to G naught plus RT ln nRT ln P by P naught. For a non-ideal behavior, which is almost everything, we don't expect this curve to be true, right? We expect maybe sometimes it will be above the curve, maybe sometimes it will be below the curve, some behavior. But there is a limit in which all curves, ideal or non-ideal, should become the same. What is that limit and why? Is it very high P or is it very low P? When do things start looking ideal? At very high pressure or very low pressure? Low pressure. Very low pressure, right? Yeah, but we are keeping temperature constant here, right? So the, yeah, no, 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 you're absolutely correct. As you increase the temperature higher, right, that's when quantum mechanical effects start to not matter, right? But as you decrease the pressure, why do things become ideal as you decrease the pressure? Little interaction, right? Decreased pressure generally means lower density. Things are like very far out from each other. They're just hanging out. It could be some very complicated two particles, but if the pressure is low, it just means there are so few of them. So this means that if I was to draw a curve, let's now think about a curve where phi is more than one, okay? So let me remind you of the full equation. The full equation is G is equal to G naught plus 
एन आर टी एल एन फाइव पी बाय पी नॉट राइट वेर फाइव इज दी फिगासिटी कोफिशियंट एंड फाइव पी टूगेदर इज नोन एज फिगासिटी राइट सो इफ फाइव इज मोर देन वन देन हाउ शुड दिस कर्व लुक रिलेटिव टू दी ब्लू कर्व शुड इट बी लोअर और हायर हायर एवरी वन अग्रीज विद except as you get to p tends to 0 then they have to start looking the same right so it will look something like this okay now if we think about phi less than 1 it's go always going to be lower except when you hit p tends to infinity g tends to minus g tends to minus infinity and that's why i said any time you draw a free energy curve at the low pressure regime it should always be going to minus infinity it does not matter whether it is ideal or non ideal there is difference in the middle okay and here i drew some idealized cases in which case phi was more than 1 at any pressure right at all pressures in reality you could have a curve that starts here it will it always has to starts here then it stays under then it goes above then it comes under then it goes above and then whatever you could have a curve like that yeah go ahead is the red curve still higher than the blue curve for negative g negative g means nothing i mean for like i mean in the graph it's always higher it's always higher the red curve is mathematically always higher but the question is as p tends to 0 it's minus a million versus minus a million plus 0.1 the difference becomes small it's always higher per construction right because phi is more than 1 but on the dot is negative but that's the same that's the same for ideal and for non ideal the difference is not coming from ln of p over p not the difference is coming from ln of phi okay yeah it's i will write it down more carefully so g is equal to g not Plus n R T L N phi plus n R T L N p by p naught. Right. This here is the blue part. Right. This here is the blue part. So a a a real material will probably have a curve that looks like the green one. And if you are willing to take my word, which I'm going to prove next, that phi more than one means repulsive forces, and phi less than one means attractive forces. what is this telling you this is telling you that until this black point that i just circle over here until that pressure phi was less than 1 right so this chemical was dominated by attractive forces then something happened something strange happened and all of a sudden repulsive forces are starting to dominate right and in chemistry we are always for look out for these things because it means that suddenly a different phase became stable right you can get signatures of these things right so for the first time we are starting to see signature of phase transitions we saw it earlier also remember when we talked about solid liquid and gas and we showed how like low temperature of solid this is yet another example of a phase transition so uh, this marks phi less than 1 changing to by more than one or repulsive forces changing to attractive forces i mean in reality both forces are present right like you mentioned there is always electrostatic there is always core it's a question of what is dominating what right is this clear now let's forget about the green curve and let's focus on the red the blue and the black and now let's try to understand better why is it that phi more than 1 corresponds to repulsive forces okay in order to do that i'm i'm going to draw this figure once again on the next page and then do it in that instead of uh, scribbling over here and let's keep the same colors so the most important thing is everything starts at minus in minus infinity okay 
Okay. In this regime, G tends to minus infinity for all phi, just does not matter. Okay. <clears throat> this one is phi more than one. This one is phi equal to one. And this one is phi less than one. So let's consider a particular pressure. Okay, some pressure. Let's fix, focus on one pressure. At this pressure, you have a chemical for which phi is equal to one. Let's say you started with that. Now you happen to increase, you did something and the phi became more than one, okay? What's the best way to explain this? Give me a moment. So that's a subtle argument. I want to proceed carefully. No, I don't have to think about a constant pressure line. It's what I need to do is to think about the same value of Gibbs free energy. So I'm going to draw a horizontal line. Okay. For some reference value of Gibbs free energy, let's call it G1. Okay. Now think carefully. This is not my argument. This is an intuitive argument. The red curve is stabilized at this pressure, right? To have the same value of Gibbs free energy, the red curve should have the pressure marked over here, P phi more than one, okay? The blue curve should have pressure here, marked as P phi is equal to one. And the black curve should have pressure marked as P phi, less than one, right? Why did I draw a constant G line? Because I'm trying to compare three chemicals at constant temperature and pressure. At constant temperature and pressure, G is the defining free energy, right? So I want to compare three chemicals, the red one, the blue one, and the black one, okay? At the same free energy, because free energy is how they will coexist, right? Same free energy is how they will coexist. At this free energy, the pressure taken by the red one is the smallest. The pressure taken by the blue one is slightly larger. The pressure taken by the black one is the highest. If you take a system, let's say you are all particles. In my head, sometimes you are. Don't quote me. And let's say I increase the repulsive forces between you. You all hate each other. What would be the effect of on pressure? What is pressure? Where does pressure come from? against the walls, right? The, an outsider, Amy Mullen is standing outside. He's like, wow, this club, oh, sorry, I'm teaching there. He's really trying to escape, right? So the more you hate each other, the higher will be the pressure. The more you repel each other, you will try to escape. And that is what we are seeing here. The pressure is higher, right? So the black curve, therefore, so did I, I always get this. No, 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 I messed up. No, no. Let me think. No, oh, I made it up. Huh? No, 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 no. We are going to finish this argument. Why, you have to go somewhere? I know, no, that's the no, 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 we'll do it now. 
the argument I just made proves the opposite. It's terrible. Did you make a mistake in before by except five less than one? <laughs> Let's ask Wikipedia. It's possible. Then I'll have to find all these students from last year at 684. I'll have to, you know, you they issue a recall. I'll have to issue a fugacity recall. Okay, what does Wikipedia say? Fugacity coefficient. You guys can also check. Because like then you would still like have the same pressure, right? Like it's like the energy is determined by whether you are. Yeah, but then how would I compare attractive to repulsive at the same pressure, right? I don't know, the higher energy state. <laughs> <laughs> no, when phi is more than one, Repulsion dominates, so my proof is wrong. My last year students, I gave the right proof. So we have to think. Come on, let's think together. So if I drew a vertical, so what is the, okay, so what is wrong in the proof that I just made? Why is it leading us to the wrong conclusion? It's saying that as the repulsive forces are higher, the pressure is lower, which is true. Well, that is the statement, but what is the wrong, what, why is it leading to that conclusion? So in this one, let's say maybe it is right and I'm just rushing. So at the same Gibbs energy, you can get the same Gibbs free energy with lower pressure for phi more than one case, right? Oh, it's correct. Wow. I... Has anyone seen Kung Fu Panda? Huh? I have to be like Kung Fu Panda and believe in myself. That's exactly right argument. Let me write it down. This is tricky every time. Huh. And Maria Delian really sent me home. <laughs> what would have Pakora thought of me? So, okay, let's go through it carefully. So we are saying at the same, to, in order to get the same free energy, okay, in order, and I will write it down, so next time I don't miss it. I don't think you can find these details in most books. That's the other thing. The books just say this statement and they don't prove it carefully. In order to have the same G value, P phi more than one, okay, is smaller than P phi equal to one, okay? which is smaller than P phi less than one. What is the meaning of low pressure? That means you are not trying to escape this room. You don't hate each other, right? There are attractive forces. You are very happy hanging out here, right? So lower pressure means attractive forces dominate, right? That's the meaning of lower pressure. Right? But this is the opposite of what you stated. Yeah. Did I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I was wrong about. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. I think you made a mistake earlier. Yeah, so I need to uh, issue an erratum. So phi no, there's still a problem. Something is wrong. So you're saying this is true? Yes, I'm convinced my proof is correct. So where am I making a mistake? When I'm looking at some random website, which is probably correct. <laughs> it says that phi 
less than one is when attraction dominates. Are we at constant temperature? Temperature is not playing a role here. We forget about temperature. It's some fixed temperature. I got happy for a moment. So what's wrong in this argument? So the inequality you propose, you think that that's wrong or that's right? Which equality? This inequality. That this is wrong because I am convinced this is correct as per my proof, but when I'm checking here, it's the wrong statement. Apparently, pi phi less than one is a sign of attractive forces, not the other way around. I'm kind of confused to why pressure is increased with the force Because if they're attractive forces, wouldn't that make it more compressible and then more pressure? Am I thinking that wrong? You know, attractive forces decrease pressure. Think about Van der Waals gas, right? The second term in Van der Waals gas equation of state is a negative term that comes from attractive forces. So if system, uh, rip, uh, yeah, that, that part I'm confident in. The repulsion leads to higher pressure you're trying to escape. So isn't the case that phi is smaller than one is the phenomenon of cavitation because you don't have enough density so the particles to uh, go in one place, and therefore that corresponds to the higher pressure at the location. There could be other argument, but first I want you to help me understand what is wrong in this argument. If someone can convince me, I give you five bonus points in the midterm. What is wrong in this argument? I mean, the argument is correct. You apply pressure to the point where the cavitation happens. You cannot talk about a point that the point in the space that there is no particle, there is no. We don't have to invoke point. cavitation. You know, let's assume the system is homogeneous. Cavitation but means the cavitation. Because by less than one, the cavitation will happen because by is less than one. Why? Because think of that's a circular yeah. argument. Because if I'm thinking about it, I don't have enough density. So therefore... That's a circular argument. Be, be, be careful. Be careful. Phi less than 1 is not telling you anything about density. Phi less than 1 is just telling you the pressure that you calculated. The... But the density and temperature, they're all related by uh, the wave wavelength. So it's not. So don't get complicated. I don't get complicated. And... Don't get complicated. We don't have to invoke that. I think this argument is correct. I'm misinterpreting it. This, this what I wrote over here, is correct. Yeah, go ahead. What if you try drawing the graph with F instead of P? Doesn't that tell you anything? I don't think it would. It would, because with F, it's the same thing. It's always the same logarithmic behavior. So that does not tell us anything. But it's it's a it's a bigger, it's, yeah, this, this is correct. But the argument from here to the next line, we have to make carefully. And I don't think we have to invoke capitation. I'm not saying that you're wrong. We can make a simpler argument without inventing more concepts. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I did a quick Google search and it said that the, the attractive and repulsive were flipped with the uh, definitions that you gave the uh, coefficient. No, so what uh, what I wrote over here, this is correct. Really, where? Somewhere. 
No, no, so what are we getting here? We are getting that for the same gift energy, the pressure for the red one is lower than the pressure for the blue one, right? And we are yeah. saying that lower pressure means attraction. So we are saying that attractive forces dominate for phi more than one. Yes, yes. Is that what they're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Send me a link on Slack. Okay. Post it on general so I can screen share here. Yeah. Did you post? I'm about to. It's on general. So science direct. It says um just to make sure I'm not an idiot. Science direct is a research paper, so be careful. Okay. So, the gas leak coefficient less than one indicates the molecules are repulsion down. There it is. Well, which part do you want me to look at? I don't think we should go to a research paper for this. I mean, that's fine. That's probably correct, but let's try to. Sure, it's probably correct, but I want to. Yeah. Give me one minute. We will finish this today. As long as it takes, no, I'll finish in five minutes. Can I get from this point? Nope. <laughs> Did some yes. other sources say that for phi less than one, the attractive forces would dominate for the range P equal to zero to P equal to current pressure? Yeah, no, this this is correct. I, I don't doubt this. I think there is a problem in my argument. This is this is correct. Phi less than one is attractive forces. Phi more than one is repulsive forces. There is something wrong in drawing this horizontal line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly. So there is something wrong in doing that. We have to try, let's try it through the vertical line, as, as Anjali suggested, and she's going to lead us through it, right? I don't know. I was like, well, it's not working. No, this argument did not work. So we'll write a question mark here. We have six minutes left. We can do it. Because I was just saying, if you go through the vertical line, that is the same pressure. No, that is probably the right way to do it because in my notes also, I have to work the line. Yeah, no, also it goes to like the highest frequency state. So the it's probably good. Unhappy, and then the attractive forces are at the lowest energy state. The same yeah, let's, let's draw the three lines and then let's think. So this will be a bonus homework problem on next homework or five points. But we're going to solve it right now. Huh? But we're going to solve it. No, no, no. I'm going to prove you why this is correct. Oh, okay. You really don't want me to solve it today. <laughs> the bonus problem is what is the contradiction here? Why was this wrong? Why was this giving us a misleading result? Okay? Because I don't understand it, so I want you to help me. <laughs> You're all PhD students except one. That is it. It's not the undergrad. Yeah, the undergrad. I got a doc his participation points. He has been skipping regularly. 
So, okay, now let's look at one particular pressure. And this is as a function of pressure and G. And yeah, so uh, Anjali's argument is simpler, but if I can repeat it correctly, what she's saying is that at, at this pressure, the phi less than one has lower free energy relative to the phi equal to one relative to the phi more than one, right? So at this pressure, phi less than one is happiest, is, the, is more stable relative to, right? So instead of equating G, we are thinking about DG, right? That's one way of thinking about it. So at a fixed pressure, yeah, this, this, this argument is definitely correct, but I'm, what is puzzling me is what is wrong in this argument. And someone needs to find out for me. Or I will lose all my hair. <laughs> at a fixed don't laugh at a fixed pressure g phi less than one is lower than g phi equal to one than g phi more than one right so at a fixed pressure so why does this tell us Yeah, go ahead. These are derivatives. So G and P are proportional to each other as P increases, so does G. In the other proof, you were trying to say the reverse was true, where yeah. as Yeah, don't 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 worry about the other proof. That's your next homework bonus problem. Let's worry about this one now. So as to fixed pressure, we are saying that G phi the the phi less than one is the Preferred attraction, but why a preferred interaction? But why is that leading to attractive? It's also going where it's like at the same yeah. in the same time. So the only thing that is being changed is the pressure. So it's saying that like the lowest curve, the lowest. I don't know actually. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> no, uh, by equal to one, it's a little no interaction. No interaction. Yes. So, uh, you know, if you want an attractive interaction, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. have one minute. This may be unrelated, but I'm still stuck on this. So kind of what, what he was saying. So who he? he? Really say, who is he? Oh yeah. What was he saying? Ben. Um, <laughs> but can we really say anything about pressure? Because it it would also depend on volume. Yes. Sure, but right now we have that. That is taken care of because we are plotting it as a function of pressure. That is taken care of. You know. It will change. The volume will change, and that—that's exactly for the blue curve. You know how exactly the, will the volume change because you have ideal gas law for the red right. and black. I'm saying, like, in terms of repulsive and attractive forces, uh -huh. how can we say things about pressure if we don't know what's, what's happening to the volume? Yeah. I see your point. Okay, well, I give up. We will start on this next time, and if someone—that's your bonus problem. Next time, I will, of course, be super careful. And we will work through this argument and we will take a I'll put a question now.